Uh, let's get started with the second session, and we're going to start off with a second talk on Calgame materials by Gabe Afley. I, I wanted to thank uh, the organizers for just uh, getting all of us together here and inviting me to, to talk to you uh, today. Uh, it's uh, really nice to be to be back at a, at a live conference rather than uh, just uh, hearing what goes on at uh, KITP over Zoom. So it's, uh, that's a real, a real pleasure. Uh, the uh, work I'm going to talk uh, to you about today is is a result of a collaboration with many, uh, many people and, and quite a few different techniques. I probably won't get around to talking about everything uh, that we've done, uh, but uh, uh, th these are the collaborators on the on the inelastic X-ray scattering, uh, and particularly important uh, was uh, Lin Yan. Uh, Zhang. Uh, uh, there is uh, also, uh, if I have time, some uh, angle resolved photo emission measurements done uh, by the postdoc uh, uh, Sandia Kahana, uh, uh, mainly uh, in the lab of uh, Felix Baumberger at, at Geneva. Uh, and uh, also very important is uh, uh, really the PI on this uh, uh, investigation is, is uh, you know, so I was just explaining, I spend most of my time doing other things, and it's just fun to dip into the condo problem again after so many years. Uh, and there are various papers. There's actually more papers now in the archive than are, than are listed here. Uh, so uh, you heard a very nice talk uh, before the break uh, about flat bands and why we should care. So I won't spend too much time on that. I'll just breeze through the view graphs. Uh, and then I'll introduce a system that we're working on, which is a very close relative of the ones that Linda introduced earlier, which is, in this case, it's iron 3 tin 2 uh, Then uh, I will talk a lot about the details of the magnetism that we wondered about, but really didn't have until we started doing you know, various uh, X-ray experiments. Uh, and then if I have time, I'll talk about uh, sort of bound state formation near the uh, gamma point in the electronic structure due to essentially a crossing between flat bands and a bendy band uh, at the uh, Fermi surface. So I think this you've already heard, classic strange metal paradigm is something like the Anderson model. And of course, the flat bands, as you heard before, come from uh, localized uh, orbitals, let's say DRF orbitals. Um, and then there's uh, those, uh, those DRF orbitals uh, talk to uh, various uh, other uh, electrons, uh, let's say S or P electrons, which are represented by these operators C, and they live in a band. Okay, so in, in a in a bendy band, in a in a non-flat band, and of course uh, this is the classic uh, paradigm which gives rise to all of the wonderful uh, physics uh, uh, in in the heavy fermion systems, and probably also quite a few uh, transition metal oxides. Uh, now, the various, this is the simplest route to flat bands, uh, which is just you say that they're flat because the atoms don't interact uh, in, uh, by themselves. Uh, in other words, there's no, there's no hopping uh, of these D electrons by themselves. They have to involve this, these uh, C operators somehow. Uh, but other ways, of course, more recently, uh, people have, have, of course, talked about uh, getting flat bands, for example, in Moray systems where you essentially expand the unit cells uh, to a very large uh, extent and then uh, you get a whole bunch of band at that certain magic angles you can get flat bands uh, and it's essentially this is essentially a, a result of, of some kind of uh, geometric frustration uh, which actually operates not just that uh, for the large unit cells that you get in Moray systems but also operates as we heard on triangles uh, very easy to see even uh, with a spin model that you get frustration and, and if you build up, you can build up, for example, uh, Kagome lattices out of these uh, triangles, various other kinds of lattices as well, but let's say you get Kagome lattices and, and actually a long time ago, uh, yeah, actually Premi Chandra wrote this little review article in, in, in Science, very short thing, uh, about you know how you can get uh, essentially disorder in a highly ordered system. So you have, of course, a highly ordered system is this lattice, but once you start putting electrons or spin uh, on, on, this, on this lattice, actually 
uh, you can get localized degrees of freedom and, and effectively the system can be thought to be disordered because the localized degrees of freedom don't talk to each other. And so as you go across the lattice can assume essentially random values as, as you, as you uh, and what particularly uh, important uh, points here uh, that we, we, uh, we made, or, or that not just we made, but various other people knew at the time, is that you know, these local degrees of freedom, uh, you can think of them in terms of uh, uh, interfering uh, electrons, but you can also realize them quite easily, for example, in the ferromagnetic Kagame uh, system, uh, where uh, the localized degrees of freedom are essentially these optic modes, optic mode, which is confined to a single hexagon in this defect lattice, which is uh, constituting the Kagame. Uh, now, these guys here actually wind up giving rise in the case of a ferromagnet to this famous uh, flat band. And of course, in addition to that uh, flat band, you have the usual uh, ferromagnetic uh, uh, spin waves. And you have both actually an optic mode and a uh, acoustic mode, and those actually also host uh, host direct points. And as I say, the, as we heard this morning, of course, this can happen for electrons as well. Exactly the same phenomena. This is just flipped around because the sign of the interaction was flipped. Uh, here is the flat band on the bottom. Here are your your uh, direct nodes, uh, and you have your usual uh, conventional dispersing uh, fermions. And of course, uh, people have uh, gotten very excited about this because, of course, if you have flat bands, then interactions matter much more. That's, of course, the charm of all of the work that people have been doing on the uh, on the twisted uh, twisted bilayers. And uh, there's uh, you know various papers, and this is one of many, uh, you know, saying that you know you might even be able to get uh, high temperature fractional quantum Hall states. Uh, I don't think we've found any of those yet, but I think uh, maybe in the last talk you heard some materials which might eventually show this. Uh, so, uh, what about experiments? Uh, so we heard uh, quite a lot about uh, about the electron electronic uh, sector and, and what happens uh, in the last talk. Uh, now, experiments actually. Uh, have not been so easy. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of the experiments uh, um, have been coming 10, 20 years. But materials uh, to, to look at them uh, involves a actually the insulating, there's actually no good single crystal insulator uh, representation of a Kagame magnet. And uh, and what people then have to do is they take a, a lot of crystals and then assemble them uh, into some kind of a, a target which they can then do neutron experiments on, let's say, uh, to to essentially resolve uh, resolve the magnetic Hamiltonian and actually go look for flat bands. Uh, in this particular case here, uh, they were not able quite to get a single crystal together. They got essentially what was some kind of oriented powder. And, and they were uh, able to see not something as nice as I showed you a few slides ago with a you know, full uh, sort of uh, 2D dispersion, but because it's a powder, they were able uh, roughly to see uh, essentially uh, an acoustic branch uh, sort of coming up you know, from zero here, acoustic uh, spin waves, and then some hint of an optic mode uh, up here. So this is an insulator, which should, should be very simple. It's very easy to calculate as well. No conduction electrons. But this is basically the state of the art of looking for flat magnon bands uh, in, uh, in, in the Kagame system. Uh, metals actually are actually even more, more challenging. And uh, uh, here is actually just some uh, data on a, on a system related again to the systems we heard before. Where people look for the magnon bands uh, in cobalt three, tin two, sulfur two. Uh, again, it's actually here they had single crystals and they were able to find acoustic modes. But uh, if they went up to the higher energies, the flat mode in this case would be above the acoustic modes. They, they didn't uh, see anything at all. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the common technique uh, 
for looking for flat bands in these magnetic Cagnier systems is, is neutron scattering. In neutron scattering, typically you have to attach the sample to the cryostat, you do that with glue. Uh, and it turns out that, that there's this unfortunate thing that in the RM10, where the flat pan was predicted to be was exactly where you have essentially uh, uh, phonons from the glue. And, and so uh, here uh, is glue. And so that sort of locked out the view of, uh, of uh, flat bands, uh, actually in this, uh, this class of materials, all of which have similar, uh, uh, similar, uh, very similar exchange constants. Okay, so uh, that gets us to the material that we're looking at. This is iron uh, 2 This is a bilayer, uh, bilayer Kaganir system. So that's the basic structural motif. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the, what the crystals look like. Again, they're really too small to do any kind of neutron scattering to decide uh, what the uh, uh, magnetic Hamiltonian might be. Uh, it's, uh, truth to tell, it's not an exact Kagame system in the sense that these are not isosceles triangles. They're actually distorted slightly. Uh, and this material is a very high temperature uh, ferromagnet. It's got a Curie point of around 600, uh, 600 Kelvin, but has this curiosity that at around 150 uh, degrees uh, Kelvin, uh, or slightly below, uh, it has a spin reorientation transition. And, and so the spins actually start out lying perpendicular to the basal planes, and then they rotate around. Uh, there's actually uh, a first order uh, phase transition uh, here. Uh, terminating actually uh, in, a, in a critical point uh, uh, temperature plane. So this is actually a, a, a rare instance of a magnetic analog uh, to a liquid gas uh, critical plane. So what about the microscopic magnetism? So uh, what are the spin and orbit contributions to the ordered moment? This is important because for this material to be topologically non-trivial, you need some kind of spin orbit coupling. You need, uh, you, if you don't have spin orbit coupling, this is a boring material, both from the point of view of the electrons and from the point of view of the magnons. And so it's important to determine, uh, you know, whether you have any kind of orbital moment to work with here. So that's uh, one uh, open question. The next question is, what is a microscopic uh, spin Hamiltonian? And uh, the last is, is uh, how important is it that this is a metal? Is this itinerant or localized? Uh, how, uh, if it's localized, uh, you know, where is it in terms of the mixing between the spin degrees of freedom and, and the electronic degrees of freedom? And what you have here, if you have spin orbit coupling, is a very curious situation. You have, of course, magnons, which will be topological because of the spin orbit coupling leading to a jelazinski maria interaction. And at the same time, you, you have, of course, the electrons, which themselves also will be living in a, in a system which, due to the spin orbit coupling, will also be topologically non-trivial. So we have a, we, we, uh, we are here now looking at a, a, a new situation. We're trying to essentially reimagine what happens to stoner when the bands are topological. Both the magnetic excitation bands are topological as well as the, uh, as well as the electron. Bands. And so this brings us to the technique that we that sort of am going to bore you a little bit with technique because I think it's extremely important to, to understand what we are able to do uh, nowadays with x-rays. Uh, I'm going to talk about x-ray uh, magnetic uh, circular dichroism. And uh, what, of course, this is like any other, this like any other optical uh, dichroism. Uh, you try to look at the uh, some optical response function where you vary the helicity of the incoming uh, the incoming photons. And what's particularly useful uh, with X-rays is, of course, you can get to core levels. And so you can get, for example, in the transition metals, you can get to the 2p core levels, which, as you know, uh, due to spin orbit coupling, are 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 split essentially two ways: is a, a, a 2p a half state and the 2p three half state. Okay, so one, one of course has, has these, these two possibilities and then there's four states uh, up here. 
for the three p three halves for the two p three half states, and then what the photon does is it takes you from this two p uh, uh, atomic core to the three d bands, and so you can imagine that that uh, as you uh, if, if that you would depending on the polarization of course of this band here that you will get a different absorption cross section depending on where, what your helicity is relative to the magnetization of the total system. Okay, so this is the majority band here, this yellow one. This is the minority band, which is the, the blue one. And uh, basically you, you would expect actually to see a different absorption for negative helicity than positive helicity. Now, helicity, uh, actually the photon, the 8RP operator, as you know, is, is spin conservative, but angular momentum non-conserving, so you can raise or lower angular momentum. And, and, and because of spin orbit coupling in this band here, then uh, you can get these different absorption curves depending on the photon helicity. Now this shows what, what the experimental data look like for iron. So this is the X-ray absorption cross section. And this is basically for uh, the helicity basically uh, parallel or, or anti-parallel to the uh, external uh, anti-parallel anti or par parallel to the to the uh, magnetization vector of the of the material, which of course you can modulate just by the external field. And you'll see that the L3 edge, for example, if I go from uh, from right helicity, right circular polarized to left circular polarized. This drops very, very substantially. So you almost lose half of the absorption cross section by going from this helicity to that helicity. On the other hand, on the L2 edge, uh, where you have only two states here, uh, you actually go from, you actually increase uh, the uh, absorption uh, cross section. Uh, what's in between here, up or down, this is just simply linearly polarized light, and that just uh, essentially forms the average of the two. That's the black curve. Now, uh, all of this stuff, and I'm not going to, believe me, I'm not going to go through this with you, although I could not spend the rest of the hour, it is, of course, uh, can be expressed in terms of the atomic transition mat matrix elements. So you can go through and try to essentially decipher by looking at these uh, transition matrix elements. Uh, and actually, in the atomic physics, actually, they come out fairly simply, the transition matrix elements between these 2p states, which are spin orbit split, and the 3d states, which are spin orbit split. Again, I'm not going to go through all of this, but the bottom line is that uh, depending on, on uh, where you're starting from here, for example, from let's say if you're at the L3 edge, uh, you will find that uh, the raising, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, right circular polarization uh, will take you essentially give you a certain set of matrix elements uh, between these P3 half states and, and these D states. And those matrix elements are actually quite large. On the other hand, left circular polarization will be substantially less. This is plus and minus. Zero means just linear polarization. And these are the matrix elements. This is all of that algebra that I basically diluted into a single chart. Uh, you, if you add all of this together, basically you would get essentially in the intensity at the L3 edge uh, going from this uh, P3 half state up to this uh, D states, that would be 50 for right circular polarization, whereas it would be 30 in these units for left circular polarization. This is all Klebsch-Gordon technology, okay? So this is all understood, extremely uh, well tested over the last 30 years. Uh, now, I'm gonna show only one more formula and the rest of the talk hopefully will be like a chemistry talk. Uh, no, well, there may be one or two formulas, but, but not, nothing serious. Uh, the bottom line is that actually you can distill out from these atomic selection rules uh, a set of uh, relationships between these absorption, the integrals of these absorption cross sections for the L2 and L3 edge and the orbital and spin moment uh, of the of the magnetic state that you're probing in the D shell, in the, in the 3D shell. And in particular, the orbital moment is very simple. The orbital moment is simply, uh, the net orbital moment is, is actually simply proportional 
to the, the difference between left and right circular polarized uh, uh, light absorption. So that's just simply the magnetic circular dichroism, just the integral over the energy gives you the orbital moment. Now the spin is a little bit more complicated, but basically uh, it has these relatively simple coefficients, which again just follow from touch Gordon. Uh, and uh, what it means is, is the year actually you're seeing the you're seeing the circular dichroism at the two uh, resonances, the L2 and L3, are weighted somewhat differently, and that at the end of the day uh, that gives you uh, the spin. Okay. And again, that follow, this follows essentially from clebsch gordon uh, technology and spin orbit coupling. So it allows you a unique measurement to decide how much spin you have and how much orbit you have in the magnetization. And this shows you the results now for, for uh, actually these are the first time such measurements have been done on these, these Kagame ferromagnets. Uh, but for the iron, iron 3 tin 2, uh, and let me just walk you through this. So this is basically uh, the black curve, okay? So this is uh, left circular polarization, C minus. Right circular polarization is the dashed lines. And you see a very, oops, you see a very big discrepancy uh, between this and that. Now, in between, there's actually iron, pure iron, just for comparison. So you see, actually, there's more dichroism for this iron 3102 3, than there is in, in elemental iron. Interestingly enough, uh, then if you go to the, uh, to the L2 edge, actually there, uh, the, the dichroism is rather more similar. So what that means is actually that the spin and orbit uh, contributions are actually differently weighted in iron than they are in the Kagame compound. In fact, it turns out that in the Kagame uh, compound, the ratio of the orbital to the spin moment is actually 0.22, so 22%. And this is to be compared with 0.043 for pure iron. So that means this iron 3102 has, a, has more spin orbit, more uh, orbital moment than iron does. And so that's actually very good for topology. It makes us feel uh, very well that, that, uh, that uh, we have a good basis also for Jelazinski-Maria interactions and also for all of the interactions that you're required to, to, to open up uh, various gaps that we might want to open up in the electronic band structure. Uh, now this gives rise to all kinds of other things one can do because it, not once, it, once you, of course, you have this kind of sensitivity to the magnetism of the X-rays, uh, the world of, of macroscopic or mesoscopic magnetism opens up in the form of microscopies. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these, but these are the domain patterns that one actually can image because, of course, you can spatially resolve this XMCD as you go across the sample. So this is work that I'm not involved with, but, uh, but led by, uh, by Yonga. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk more now about the microscopics. Now, now you'll all, of course, remember the optical theorem. The optical theorem says that somehow, uh, you know, things that are, uh, that are not absorbed must be, must be scattered. And, uh, and so uh, we really want to learn uh, not just about the static magnetism, which is, of course, stuff that doesn't scatter inelastically. We'd like to learn about the dynamics. And for that, of course, we need to, we need to uh, learn something about the final states in this absorption process. So we're going to look at the scattering, the scattered photons in uh, resident inelastic X-ray diffraction. So here what you see is you come in uh, with a, a photon, of course, Ki. With the absorption experiment, we didn't, we integrated over everything that came out. But here now we're going to uh, we're going to uh, actually uh, specify the final states, and we're going to just look at photons coming out. So I'm, I have the final state knowledge, and of course with that final state knowledge, uh, I can uh, of course uh, construct uh, essentially various uh, response functions uh, to the material. Uh, I could look for energy loss processes of, of different kinds. I could look for energy loss processes. Uh, involving magnons, but of course is also uh, fluorescence as well as electron hole pair uh, excitations, all kinds of stuff uh, that uh, I could try to identify if I knew something about that final state. The energy uh, as well as the helicity as well as the uh, momentum. And the way the experiments are done 
And of course, I come in, this is now, uh, sorry again, this is quite complicated, but here's my crystal. I'm coming in with a particular momentum, Ki, uh, and then I'm going out. I'm selecting a, a momentum to analyze it to, to go out. There's, of course, a net uh, uh, momentum transfer. And, and uh, just to remind you, now, of course, there are various selection rules to do with the polarization uh, factors. Uh, the inelastic scattering cross-section, actually, for this, uh, for these, at these resonances, actually has a matrix element which goes like the cross product of the uh, incident uh, uh, polarization, of the outgoing polarization times the ingoing polarization. That cross product dotted into the magnetization fluctuation rep at that particular wavelength. Now, uh, uh, that thing here, actually for spin waves, uh, it simplifies enormously. Uh, when we just look at the MCD, in other, in other words, the, the, the dichroic part of this cross-section. And for spin waves, we actually have a, a nice geometric formula like this. Just to remind you, this looks very different than the formula, basically, for the conventional absorption MCD, uh, which goes like a cosine of alpha. Basically, that's just the dot product of the incident polarization times uh, the magnetization. Okay, so these are the final states that we can see. So what we see here is uh, a, a map. It's called a Ricks map. This shows the incident energy, and this shows the energy loss associated with the scattering process. And uh, what you see up here, and this is a logarithmic scale. So everybody knows that if you hit something with x-rays, it glows. And so that's fluorescence, just x-ray fluorescence. That's x-ray fluorescence, of course, is at a fixed final energy. That just is something to do with, the elect with an electron coming from the conduction uh, uh, C or just at the Fermi level back down into the, uh, into the, uh, into the uh, unoccupied, uh, unoccupied uh, two-piece state. So that's your fluorescence signal. Uh, you also see, of course, some kind of elastic scattering signal. That's just elastic scattering. Uh, from the sample could come from, from uh, defects or what have you. Uh, and, and then actually there's something in here, there's a true Raman process, a true Raman process which is uh, independent of the energy which is this, uh, which is stuck at this, uh, at this energy transfer, something like 160 uh, millivolts here coming across. And so uh, we now uh, can actually just show you a cut through that energy scan at those low energies, at the low, uh, just a, a slice of that energy scan at low energy transfers. And what you see here is actually uh, something uh, like this. Uh, for a sample which you have not put into a magnetic field, there's still a slight uh, dichroism. And, and, but if you put, and, and you can see that there's actually a, a dichroic signal which is fairly close to zero energy transfer. And, the, but then also a dichroic signal up at these higher energies. You get something like uh, uh, 0.15 EV. And what we did was, uh, uh, we, uh, we then put the sample in the magnetic field. And uh, both of these signals, the, the dichroism got much larger. We essentially suppressed one of the polarizations, the, the right circular polarization here was suppressed. And so what that corresponds to is, of course, a sample which in the MCD image, so you take, I showed you, before, said before, you can take micrographs of the, of, of the magnetic condition of the sample by sweeping an X-ray beam across the sample and looking at the diachrism point by point. The sample with the magnetic field on it is completely yellow, that's polarized in one state, whereas the other sample is in the mixed state that actually never has the MCD, even that you see, uh, that you, that you see uh, here, that maybe just a little bit around the edges. So you've enhanced the magnetic circular dichroism. Of course, you're seeing it at all because you've broken the symmetry at the sample. The symmetry at the sample is not broken. You don't see that. Okay, so there are polarization selection roles here at work, and they're different from those for fluorescence and absorption. And, and the bottom line is that these uh, spin waves that we see are things that we identify as spin waves, particularly this uh, optic mode is actually, uh, is actually following uh, this, this red curve, which is the theory uh, expression I showed you a few, uh, few uh, minutes ago. Uh, this is the absorption, which is this cosine. 
Now, at the end of the day, we now actually can essentially resolve unambiguously without any, uh, without worrying about glue or any, uh, any, anything else, a magnetic signal simply because we have identified uh, that signal using the magnetic circular dichroism and check the matrix elements as well uh, in this last, uh, by this last method. And so what you find is you see actually very nice optic mode, basically, uh, which is uh, actually dispersionless at uh, around 0.1, uh, 0.15 EV. And this shows actually uh, the, the, the data points and that, that were found as a functional momentum. You also discover that what looked like elastic scattering is actually not elastic, it's actually moving out. And that scattering is simply the acoustic mode that comes with the Kagame. So, there's a very simple life here. There's actually only one coupling constant that is enough to account for this dispersion. There's a single J1 exchange constant. This is the Hamiltonian. Uh, and, and you can then uh, ask the question is, what is the connection of that J1 to the, to the uh, uh, bulk magnetism of the material? In fact, uh, mean field is actually rather close to the, uh, the mean field expression is rather close to the actual T. So you get about 800 K for this. Uh, life actually is not quite so simple. So I had put up a list of questions at the beginning of the talk. Uh, is, uh, is this system really just described as an insulator as I just tried to? And the answer is actually no. If you, if you actually now take the Hamiltonian I just described with that simple exchange constant and simple spin and calculate, including the resolution of the instrument, what the uh, magnetic signal should be, you actually get this pattern here. And in fact, it's very important is that you see, of course, your acoustic modes down here, and you see optic modes up here. And in fact, the optic mode should be invisible here. Whereas in, this, in the experiment that we did, the optic mode actually has a spectral weight over here, by the, on the left hand side is a spectral weight as a function of momentum. The optic mode actually has, has, has a, a very big spectral weight, more or less momentum independent spectral weight coming into the long wavelength limit. That's very important. Another thing that's very uh, interesting is that the, the damping constants are, uh, are, are very, very large. So you're finding that the optic mode damping, you know, starts out at 30 millivolts and then rises very, very rapidly, uh, very rapidly as you go across the zone. Likewise, the acoustic mode dampings are uh, extremely, extremely large. So you have this spin wave amplitude, I'm almost done, basically going to zero normally should go to zero as Q goes to zero. And the reason for that is clear. The optic, it's an optic mode. And of course, the dipole matrix elements in the long wavelength limit should vanish because these things are tipped in opposite directions. There are six of these, three tip one way, three tip the other way. So you should, you should get zero amplitude as, as momentum goes to zero. In this system, for some interesting reason, the optic mode amplitude does not go to zero, it actually stays high. And, and to, to make that happen, actually, you need to actually couple to some other degree of freedom, which actually has an L equals one, which you can, which you can actually see at long wavelengths. And so this is a, this is a, this I think is a, a qualitative, really interesting qualitative result, which you need to deal with theoretically. So let me conclude here. We've actually provided the first experimental observation of a flat magnonic band in a Kagame single crystal. The second thing is the matrix elements are, are very unusual. Actually, there's a high spectral weight for Q goes to zero, which just deviates basically from any conventional spin wave theory. Uh, that you might have. This we suspect though is connected to the strong electron hole damping, uh, hole pair damping, which you see for both the optic and the acoustic modes. But we have to figure out essentially how do we get essentially angular momentum to come out uh, uh, of this in the long wavelength limit when we decay away from the conventional, uh, from, 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 uh, from the conventional spin wave. Thank you very much.
Hi, Gabe. Yeah, um, hi. So my question is, uh, you started out by saying this might be an example of a stoner magnet. Uh, yes. Does it actually, uh, so you're saying that um, above TC there are no local moments? I, we haven't measured above TC. I, okay, because that's how one would uh, establish, right, that um, T, above TC there are no local moments, they form at the ordering temperature. Well, the, the other way, of course, is you can look at the uh, S of Q omega at low temperatures. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if, if it's a stoner magnet, then you see a, a stoner continuum in addition to spin waves. Okay. And, and, and what's interesting in this case is it seems we, we actually don't see that. But what we do see is, is, is a, clear, uh, a, a clear sign of decay, strong decays into electron, uh, into electron hole pairs. In fact, uh, if you look at this, I mean, was, you can fit these... Uh, these decays as a function of Q to this power law. It's actually not four, it's three, but with a very, 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 very big prefactor. So uh, any multi-magnon decay uh, theory or anything like that would not give you these huge uh, decays factors. And so there's, there's a, you have, uh, I would say you're on the, you're somewhat more localized, but you have very, very strange things happening. And the strangest thing is that this, the optic, you know, the usual concept of the optic mode uh, being, um, having zero weight, spectral weight in the long wave equipment is just simply not there and it's, it's violated in space. It's not a small effect. Uh, okay. And that, but, but we don't see in this material, we do not see in this material the, the electron hole pair continuing to associate with a simple stoner theory. Not in this material. Thanks. So, uh, do you expect to see from ordinary spin wave theory right here, um, do you expect to see um, Dirac crossings in ordinary spin wave theory yes. And, yes. and do you observe it? Not, not here. Okay. But you, you do expect it. And, and of course, it, that's been a topic. I've worked with uh, Bolotsky on, on, on that. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's. So, yeah, so nice talk. Uh, may I give you a, a naive question? So, uh, why, you know, amplitude should go to zero for insulator in a square wave theory? Uh, do you have intuitive picture? It doesn't, it's a simply, you just simply sum up, uh, these things are all, there are three, there are six spins here, mm -hmm. and they're going, the, the, there are, the three are going one way and three going the other way, and I have them, I got zero. And uh, you are suggesting that, uh, you know, those, you know, Q equals zero mode coupled with the uh, conduction electrons, right? So, so the only way I can get this to happen is if there's, if there's some coupling uh, to the, to the can, some, something there, which essentially has, has an angular momentum of one. Yeah, but, but it's kind of quite unusual, you know, Q equals zero, you know. Uh, Q equals zero is, is, a, is, yeah, but it's a normal, a normal thing. A Q equals zero in any anti fermat you see absolutely nothing, zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so an insulating system that's, you know, it, with one exception, if you have a crystal field level, if you, you do have a Van Fleck susceptibility, which of course, uh, in, a, a, in a normal insulator, you can have higher line crystal field levels. They will correct that result. But, but what we're seeing here is a huge effect in a metal. And, and so what means is there's something there that would play the role of a crystal field level in an ordinary insulator, which is much bigger, which is a very big correction. I so this is, a, it's, I, this is a very, I think this is a very, very profound result, actually, that. And so, of course, if, if for some reason the spin waves coupled to some uh, rain currents, for example, then this could then, of course, this will be allowed. Great, thank so if there are ring currents in the system, and of course the ring currents are present in topological systems. So, so this is why I posed the question at the beginning of the talk: is you know what what happens when I have essentially topological magnons interacting with the topological electrons? And so this is why this is interesting. Uh, yeah. 
Thanks for the talk. I'm trying to understand with uh, what high energy flat collective excitations may have to do with physics that happens at low energies is because we're interested in any possible phase transitions that these could drive. So in terms of thinking in that direction, if I think of these magnon bands as being gapped, then unless the gap closes, nothing should happen at low energies. But in another, in, in another way of thinking about it, these are cannot be disentangled from the low energy gapless magnon bands. So how should I reconcile this? Can the fact that these are topological magnon bands have any implications for low energy physics? Well, the only implications for low energy physics or, you know, what you would like to call low energy physics is, is going to come from the uh, acoustic modes. And, and the, optic, the optic modes are there. Uh, and, and the extent to which, you know, the, the extent to which the, uh, the acoustic modes, of course, are, are gotten from the same magnetic Hamiltonian. Uh, you know, is, is, you know, tells you that you can use a fairly simple de uh, description for the material. But, but this, this, is not, this is not meant to explain to you whatever uh, your favorite low energy physics phenomenon is in, in this material. For that, that would show up, you know, if, if, if one did much more detailed measurements of the, on, on the acoustic modes. There, there may be anomalous features of the acoustic modes, uh, but of course we haven't uncovered them with the type of resolution that we have in this experiment. Remember that the, the, the first order of business here was actually to even find the flat bands at all, and to, to even identify what the underlying spin Hamiltonian is. And so to the extent to which the, the opti that optic mode energy agrees with the uh, with the uh, with the exchange constant that I would also get for the acoustic modes means that the magnetic Hamiltonian is very simple, and of course then you can use that magnetic Hamiltonian to study the low energy properties. But, Thank but you. the matrix cell, by the way, there is one important thing: the matrix element effects, of course, relate are a way to probe the ground state because the matrix element has, and so the extent to which, of course, you you see an anomalous matrix element to the excited state. That, of course, tells you uh, tells you something about the ground state as well. So, I have a question. I have a quick question for you on the in the optic mode. Do you have any sense of the polarization, the dependence of the? I mean, sorry, is it an amplitude mode? Yeah, it's an amplitude mode. Remember, we polarize. All we've done is compare with with the theory. And so basically it's a standard spin wave, precessional spin wave. So basically we've matched, that's why there's a lot of, I showed you all this algebra, or the outcome of all this algebra. So, so you have this, you have this uh, cross section. And then at the end, when we look at the ricks, then uh, we, we think of, a, of uh, essentially propagating a semi-classical spin wave. Right, so experimentally, it's not, it, a, it's not so, so it's transverse or, or longitudinal. It's trying, well, no, these, these modes, these modes, of course, are, are simply transverse to the magnetization. Right, okay. Yeah, it's transverse to the magnetization. So, so at any, at any, they're not, they're, the polarization is not dictated by Q, by the momentum, but by the magnetization. They're precessing around the magnetization of the, which is Got static. It. But, but the Rick's data is, cons is, con is consistent with being a transverse mode. Your polarization it's dependence of your yeah, experiment. It, it, that's, the, that's the point. It's exactly okay. that. They're transverse modes. Okay. So we Thank checked. You. And longitudinal modes would have a different polarization uh, selection rule, which, of course, we calculated and it did not agree with that. So it's entirely transverse. Question over here. Yeah, I have a quick question. So uh, you mentioned that the material has a atmosphere. Um, uh, first order phase transition at uh, 100 Kelvin is that right? So does that Kelvin. change the magnetic excitation? Not at these, uh, uh, not at these high frequencies. No. Thanks. No. But but we have also not we've we've not actually done 
very detailed studies, but, but my suspicion is it won't change. And of course, the field that we've got on the sample, we need these measurements. Remember, you have to break the symmetry twice to see dichroism, right? So you break the symmetry with the light, and then you break the symmetry at the sample, because you do not break the symmetry on the analyzer side. The analyzer does is, 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 integrates over both polarization states. So you always need a field. So we've always had the sample in, in the planar, in the, in the basal plane field. But, but I, I don't suspect, I do not suspect there will be much happening. Thank uh, thanks. OK, one last question from Silva. Mm -hmm. So, so that domain structure, structure that you went over really quickly, can you explain it a little bit? Actually, I should have the author of that explain it. Oh, but you can summarize it. You should explain it. Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah so uh, this shows how the domain pattern changes um, even when the spin reorientation is not happening. So, um, so at 65 Kelvin is the low temperature phase, which is in the plane, and then the spin reorientation is supposed to happen at 120 Kelvin. So even then, there's a big changes of the domain pattern. And, and what we notice is that at low temperature, the main thing that dictates the orientation of the, let's say, the domain wall and then domains is the sample geometry. So it's um, dipolar uh, interaction dominated. And it seems like the crystal structures, so the principal axis, start playing a role at higher temperatures, like maybe at 97 Kelvin or so. So you see, like even the domain walls are rotating, what you see at 65 Kelvin and 97 Kelvin, but they're all in plane magnetization in, in the cases. Okay, uh, I'm gonna cut the questions here in the thanks game.